Hello, this is a weekly summary of interesting news in distributed systems and blockchain. My name is Thomas Bocek, so let's get right into it. The first article highlights the importance of backups. It's the following article here. Over half a million Unisuper members were unable to access their accounts for a week due to a unique Google Cloud misconfiguration that deleted Unisuper's private cloud account. And this issue described as one of a kind event was not related to a cyber attack and no personal data was compromised. And both Unisuper and Google Cloud CEOs issued a joint apology highlighting the nature of the incident and the steps taken to prevent recurrence. Service have been restored um, and all systems are currently undergoing extensive recovery, including duplication in different geographic locations to minimize future risks. And uh, this brings me to a good backup strategy. A good backup strategy is important. And one of the popular strategies is the 3 to one backup. And this 3 to one backup strategy is a method for ensuring data safety by keeping multiple copies of data across different media and location. It involves having at least three total copies of your data, two of which are local but on different devices, and one copy is offsite to protect against the possibility of physical damage like theft or natural disaster. And this approach helps mitigate the risk of data loss by spreading the potential points of failure across diverse storage solutions. I'm not sure what the backup strategy of Unisuper was, but if you have important data in the cloud, make sure you have the backups elsewhere. The next article is about load balancing. It's the following project here. And in the challenge task, you are required to use a load balancer and most of you have chosen traffic, but there are other alternatives. And one alternative that I have not seen so far in a challenge task is Pingora from Cloudflare, this thing here. And there's a good article on why they built it. In, in this article, they explain that they developed a new HTTP proxy named Pingora designed with Rust to handle over 1 trillion daily requests with only a third of the CPU and memory resources of its predecessor, Nginx. And Pingora supports many special cases that Cloudflare needs. It improves connection reuse across threads, reducing time to first byte and enhancing overall performance. Additionally, Pingora's developer-friendly interface speeds up feature deployment and reduces new connection establishment significantly. So what does it mean, developer-friendly? And uh, I think this is one of the highlights. And here is a document how to quickly start with a load balancer, the following article here. So it says we need to first, and it's in Rust, um, so we need to first run the server. Then here we can create a load balancer. This is a easy um, round robin load balancer. And uh, here you can set your IP addresses, run the load balancer, run the service, and have your load balancer in Rust written using Pingora. And uh, if you write Rust, that means uh, you have the full flexibility. You can customize whatever you want, and you're not bound to feature that is configured by a config file. And you can come up with your own features, for example, even your own load balancer algorithm. And uh, they just released Pingora uh, 02.0 last week, and I'm curious if a challenge task group is using this. I mentioned that many groups are using traffic. 
Um, they also have a new version, by the way, 3.0, also released quite recently. And uh, that magically fixed some of the WebSocket issues we have seen with one group on macOS. And um, here I want to mention the following article here that praises traffic as a powerful proxy tool highlighting its usability even beyond containerized environments because it's typically used in containerized environments and it debunks the misconception that traffic requires container engines explaining its compatibility with traditional configuration via configuration files and traffic's design in Golang allows it to run as a standalone executable making deployment straightforward. And in this article, the author also appreciates traffic's documentation, robustness, and feature like TLS path through and proxy protocol, while noting missing functionalities, for example, like user agent and IP address blocking capabilities. The next article is about a cryptocurrency mixer Tornado Cash. It's the following article here. A mixer can be used to hide traces of your uh, coins that uh, you want to hide. And uh, the developer, Alexei Pertsev, he's the developer of this Tornado um, Cash cryptocurrency mixing protocol, he has been sentenced to five years and four months in prison for money laundering by the US government, by the United States. And Persev was charged with laundering one to two billion, um, despite Tornado Cash being non-custodial and not controlling user funds. And his case highlights concerns among developers about legal liabilities for how their open source code is used. The ruling can have an impact on how developers approach privacy-focused protocols as there is currently no evidence that he actively uh, facilitating any criminal transactions besides contributing to the open source code. So my question is, where should be the line drawn? What about Monero, Zcash? What about Tor? Those are also tools that you can use to hide your traces, but they're also here for, for privacy reasons. The last article is about the head of Logbit that has been identified. It's the following guy here. And um, this article is from a German news site, also linking to other articles, for example, to this here from Brian Krebs. He's a well-known security researcher. And uh, this guy here, he was identified as the alleged leader of the Lockbit ransomware group and was traced by authorities through many digital traces. And he also discusses uh, these traces here. His online activities documented through various email addresses and phone number associated with cybercrime forums linked to his early internet aliases directly to his personal identity. And uh, this detailed tracking revealed his evolution from a malware developer to a significant player in the ransomware as a service industry. Over the years, with the help of Lockbit, cyber criminals could extort more than 500 million US dollars and Lockbit received 20% of it. Now the identity of the suspected leader has been revealed and a 10 million bounty has been placed on him. He's a 31-year-old Russian IT expert specializing in developing Windows malware. However, the threat from Lockbit still persists despite the investigations and arrests. Some members were arrested, but uh, not the head of Lockbit. And despite the investigation and these arrests, the hackers continue their attacks as evidenced by the recent attempt to extort 200 million US dollars from Boeing. And the group um, uses uh, are continuing. They're still using encrypted chat services um, and the dark web to remain anonymous and uh, to be able to sustain their criminal activities. 
and even the victims uh, that also was discovered, even if they pay the ransomware uh, not to leak data, they're not safe as the stolen data is not deleted afterwards. So there's still potential that this data can be leaked. Both article shows that backup is important. On the one hand, Google that deleted user accounts. On the other hand, we have the ransomware and this shows that backup that is off-site, not on the system itself, is quite important uh, because you never know what happens with your data. And if you have it someplace safe, you know your data is safe.